Welcome to the Sessor Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name is Danny Yang, National Director of Churches of Welcome at World Relief, and today we're talking to Molly Matthews, Molly's CEO of PushPay and the first woman to hold this position within the company. In her two years as CEO, Molly has led PushPay to build curated mobile apps for over 15,000 churches nationwide to make it easier than ever before to take religion on the go. PushPay just released its State of the Church Tech Report, an annual benchmark study that services digital trends in the church. And before you hear about it, let's first go to Ed Setzer, Editor-in-Chief of Outreach Magazine and the Dean of the Talbot School of Theology. You know, I'm old enough to remember when the State of Church Tech had to do with whether you were using those uh, overhead projectors. And so, so and, and people wouldn't have had these conversations. And just to see a tech, the engagement of tech has become so ubiquitous and influential, like literally drives decisions that we make in the life of our church and its practice. It, 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 it binds us together in significant ways. It, it uh, you know, I wouldn't say that all tech is actually, you know, you can talk about the impact of social media and cable news. It, it hasn't all been positive, yet churches have, I think, uh, rightly, uh, said, well, how are we going to make the use of these tools and make use of these tools in ways that are that are both faithful, uh, they, they kind of fulfill their purpose, and fruitful, they do it well. So uh, the the Pushpay's state of the state of church tech report is something that well, it's been on for a while. So and I, I've, I and so let's start with that. And Molly, tell us a little bit where first. How long have you been conducting that research, and what's the report's purpose? Yeah, that's great. So we've actually been doing this for three years. So this is the third annual survey that we have run. And the why behind it was really to capture a better and deeper understanding of what challenges churches are going through when they're making decisions around technology. How are they thinking about brand new technology? So metaverse, AI, cryptocurrency. How are they also thinking about budget when it comes to technology? And, and to your point, Ed, you know, how are they using technology in a way that's authentic to their mission, to their goals, and to their community? So we haven't been doing this for a hundred years. It's just been three years, but it has been very informative to us and just kind of following cultural trends and getting a deeper understanding of how these churches are making decisions. Yes, yeah, so I was really, I started reading the report uh, when it came out. I've sort of tracked it and I tend to be uh, just, you know, transparently, I tend to be a little suspicious about new research uh, because it, it often means that somebody kind of, you know, surveyed their friends and and I liked what you were doing though. So I, I, I've been tracking it and following it. So I'm so glad your team reached out. I'm so glad that we get to talk about this as, at the release of the report because I think there's a, there's several things going on that I want to try to try to understand because you know, people can sometimes uncritically use, I'm not sometimes, a whole lot of times, uncritically use uh, technology. Yet at the same time, I, I can't imagine many churches today, particularly in the West, well, maybe even in the, in the whole world, in the, whole, in the rest, functioning without some engagement of technology. It's become just a tool that we use every day in our lives, and thus it would make sense. It would be present in the life of the church. So talk to us a little bit about some of the the key findings, uh, people who are listening to this, this episode, they want to know, what did you find? What are the key findings from this year's report? Yeah, so I'll absolutely um, dive into the key findings, but I think there's something really important that you were just talking about, which also was a, a huge why behind needing more information. There are fantastic research, you know, materials that are out there. I know you guys are are um, church nerds, as you shared with me, so am I. And I'm so thankful for the Gallups and the Pew Research and Barna and all of these others that are out there getting us really great data. Um, one of the things we know to be true and how we've really shaped PushPay over the years is that our churches desire to be with their community Monday through Sunday, right? Not just on Sunday. And so one of the things that we want to do is really be able to help them stand in the gap on those non-church days. And so one of the biggest findings out of the, the report is that hybrid church is here to stay, right? Over the last couple of years, we saw the interest growing, but we also saw a lot of our churches kind of report back that the plan, right, was to step back into fully in-person. And what we saw this year is that that number really declined. Folks who are thinking in person only is about 10%. So we got about 90% of, of our churches of all shapes and sizes that are saying hybrid is here to stay. 
And so that's something that we then really want to lean into and understand how can we be of service to those churches who are trying to navigate hybrid? What does hybrid mean? It's different, just like it's different for my business. It's different for every unique church that's out there and how they want to both engage, which is so incredibly important in person, but also complement or, or have an offering that is digital as well. Yeah, let me and let me just follow up one more time, and then we'll let Daniel jump in. So when we talk about hybrid, um, and it's really tricky because even in the report you unpack some of this. Hybrid means so many different things to so many different people, it does. and um, you know some of it just means that sometimes people when they don't come to church they watch online, and and that's something that you know I couldn't get in. I'm out of town. I want to watch online. I don't go visit another church. I watch mine. But it's it's more than that. But in some cases it's less than that. So give us some of the varieties that you've seen with the hybridization. I might write an article on the hybridization of the church because that's a very real situation and maybe helpful for us to understand. Yeah. So if you you think back, right, the the first people to really do this well was, you know, Life Church when yeah. they were kind of starting this concept of of additional sites. But at that point in time, goodness, what was that, 25 years ago likely, they were still recording in one place and at the same time they were offering that in a different community or a different building. If you move forward to today, that's kind of the expected for a bigger church. But hybrid, like if I think about Crossroads Church in Cincinnati, Ohio, they are wildly tech forward. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with them. Wildly tech forward. Oh, they we, think, we, we all know Brian. We have to yeah. put up with Brian. We, <laughs> we, hi, Brian. We love you. Yeah. All right. I love it. But he's he is pushing the envelope on how the digital church can become the front door, the true front door for someone to participating on a different level, right? So I would take that as one camp. You know, every single thing they do, they are thinking about how somebody who has never stepped foot into a church could fully participate all the way through to baptism. That's one form of hybrid. Another would simply be, hey, we want to make sure that our content is available to people who online who maybe have moved away from us, who are traveling this week. And, and it's simply about just kind of replacing the in-person with the content when they're gone, just like you said, Ed. And it's everything in between. But I think one of the things that we're seeing show up in high growth churches, small and big, is they're leveraging an application so think about the apps that we use on our phones. A lot of us have our church apps, but you have Uber, you have Amazon, you have Starbucks. It's a complementary service offering to the main location, to Starbucks, to Amazon. So if you think about the leverage of a church application is it's really giving you a way to have a side-by-side -side companion between your church's experience in seat, in building, you know, living life with people all the way through to being in my pocket when I'm driving into work and I can participate in my, my church in that way. Molly, I know we're going to get into AI here in just a little bit, so I don't want to jump to that, but uh, you talked about some of the things that are staying and remaining, hybrid church and probably things like online giving. Um, help us understand a little bit more about like what, what are some other technologies that uh, have emerged over the last few years that you feel like these are probably going to stay? Yep. And then what are some of the ones that are just now emerging that we still quite don't yet know their longevity, but it seems interesting? Yeah. So I think a couple of the ones that we see really sticking. So obviously high quality video content coming out of the church. So think about live stream, but also think about content that is captured and then reshared later. So that that is definitely staying. Cryptocurrency definitely staying. So I think there was a lot of talk about that over the last couple of years, kind of rise and fall. We definitely are seeing our churches still really lean in and want to be able to receive gifts via crypto and be a part of that story. I think one of the things that we also see people really leaning into in a way that's more, I would say, exploratory is AI, and we can, we can dive into that. And then the one that it seems like people are sort of stepping away from is the metaverse. So last year, we saw a lot of people really leaning into that, especially our big kind of forward thinking churches, trying it out, seeing if they could create a, you know, a, a metaverse church where people can participate. We're definitely hearing from people that that's, that's kind of fallen off, whether it's due to budget constraint, but also I think they just weren't seeing the participation and the engagement that they would need to continue to really invest there. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we, uh, you know, we're connected to Outreach Magazine, the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast is part of the, the network of Church Leaders Podcast. And um, we, you know, one of the things we do is, you know, we're kind of, to quote um, something that 
Bob Buford said years ago, we're kind of scouts for what's going on at the church. So we give those examples. So we've, we've highlighted uh, metaverse opportunities. There are, there are ecclesiological questions that, that as a theologically minded person, I want to bring up, but we won't do that here. Um, but one of the things that I think is, is probably interested and worth noting is just how uh, connected I, I was, I was preaching at the time of this recording. I just preached this weekend at, uh, at Mariner's church, which is my home church. And we use, we use push pay. Mm -hmm. And, um, when I was sitting next to Donna about to speak at the morning service, my, my app, let me know that Ed Stetzer is about to go live for a message that I recorded two weeks prior because it had to go through and get up said online or online community. And some people have Mariners at home or Mariners hosted here where they're actually, so we have people who maybe this is like their Sunday morning experience, but they're in Bozeman, Montana, I think. And, uh, and they're using that and, and it's all interwoven in a way that was really inconceivable. Um, just, just, I mean, less than a few years ago to see all of those things together. Now it also means that you know, I'm recording a video version and, you know, seven times you preach the same message when you preach at a weekend at Mariner's Church, including one, uh, one online. But I think one of the things that it's just so interesting to us is just how these things have all just come together. And, and it's not just that. I mean, again, you can go to Home Depot and, and uh, use the Home Depot app and it'll guide you to the place where you're going to find the certain bolts you're looking for. And so people are accustomed to that. But I do wonder how for churches, which are often you know, multi-generational, some generations adopt technology at different pace and space, what advice would you give for churches who want to be involved in technology, but also recognize that they're dealing across a multi-generational spectrum and not sure what people will engage? What would, you, what would your advice yeah. be? I don't know if I'm taking oh. you out of the, the project, no, I, I know, but this but is what I you think this. about. Yeah, I love this conversation. And this is one that I've actually debated with, with a lot of absolutely incredible senior pastors across the U.S. is they have such a deep, deep desire to be of amazing, excellent service to all of those generations, right? Like, I think that's something that sometimes gets missed is like, ah, oh, these pastors are making decisions in a silo. They are not, right? Like, and you know this, Ed, you're living this, Daniel, you know this. Like, these pastors so deeply want to engage all of those different generations appropriately. But here's what I would say is, who are the power users of Facebook today? You guys know? I'm People guessing over Brent the Mother. age of 55, right? <laughs> People over the age of 55. I will right? tell you that my, my children are, maybe I shouldn't say this on the podcast in case you're listening. They, they text me when their grandmothers start commenting on their Facebook page. Right. Like, ah, so I, so I definitely think that yes. they're over there. <laughs> yes, it is. And so I think that we need to really break down our concept okay. of technology and older generations. I think that is it is false to believe that our 60, 70, 80 year old participants are not engaging in technology. They are every single day. They are paying bills online. They are ordering at Starbucks through an application so they get their stars. They are participating on Facebook. They are really leaning into this in a way that they are able to. And I think if we're being really honest, most churches in America aren't out there leading edge from a technology perspective. So they're not going to shock and awe right that generation. So I do think that this is a is a healthy conversation for a pastoral team to have to ensure that they aren't going so far to one direction that the people who are coming in and wanting to be in community in a church building feel left behind. But at the same time, our world has changed so much, right? If you think about the world 40 years ago, it would have been earth shattering for one or two families in a church to be asked because of employment to move to a different city. This happens every single day here, right? In, in Seattle, which is where I'm at, in Dallas, Texas, like in any cities, really, you're seeing a migration of people happen really, really frequently. And so I think if we want to also, right, as a church community, be of service to those folks who are moving around, we do have to think about how do we give them the ability to stay engaged with us, to not feel like they are left behind because whether it be traveling for work or even having to relocate, that they somehow lose the connectivity to this place that matters so much to them. You mentioned earlier the rise and fall of crypto and, you know, so maybe it's rise, fall and stabilizing or unknown. But I know for a long time, at least in the church world, crypto was uh, primarily a place where large donations were happening. Mm -hmm. 
Um, are you seeing a trend around the normalization of crypto around regular giving? And what are you seeing around crypto? Yeah, so we see crypto giving similar to we, how we see stock giving. As we, uh, you know, the good news is I can see behind the scenes at PushPay of like how these things interact across our, you know, 14,000 customers. And the reality is, is those crypto donations are still coming in, in in larger moments or larger chunks, right? So we're seeing end of year gifts come across, same that we would see with stock giving. So you see a lot of companies now who are servicing crypto in the same way that they do stock. Fascinating. And I, 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 um, I think the crypto people are weird. So I'm kind of interesting to see. <laughs> Daniel, are you are you doing crypto behind the scenes that I don't know about? Uh, I, I am doing crypto and I'm not weird. But real, first of all, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'd say, well, let's not debate that. Because yeah, yeah. um, I mean, Maybe I just proved your point. Aren't all the people in crypto broke now? Didn't they lose like all? Anyway, let's let's uh, let's not get too far ahead on that. So, what does it look like then? To because uh, you know we we use again. I, I mentioned that that uh, we use. We use push play, push play, and all that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. Uh, but and so people can give at Mariner's Church through those crypto things. But I have no earthly idea what that would. Be. I mean, just explain it to me like I'm five. So what okay. would that look like for someone to do that? Yeah. So you would transfer your crypto coin or Bitcoin through some kind of intermediary, similar with a stock donation, right? You would do that, and it would deposit in for your for your church, and they would do the exchange. Every church has a different. Um, way in which they handle this most, they have to cash it on receipt, right? So they don't hang on to it and kind of watch it ride the wave of the of the markets. They instead kind of bring it in cash, you know, transition And do they like go cash. buy Pokemons with it? I mean, what do you actually do with <laughs> crypto money? You, you convert it into like US dollars? You can, yes. Okay. Yeah. So you, okay. it's it's very similar to how we think about stocks, bonds, and other things, right? There's, there's some moment where you have to change that back into a currency that okay. you want to use. Yeah. Am I going to, I think at this point, all the crypto people they are, are coming for you and they're yeah, going to be I, in your comments and DMs. It's not, I mean, I know for some people like me, it's a little strange, but crypto donation platforms are actually going up. Your study said it went from 7% in 2023 to 11% in 2024. That's a 57% yes. increase. It is. I, 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 and I think it's worth noting that now, you know, more than one in 10 churches are having these opportunities for, uh, for donations as well. Yeah. So, so it's not. Again, it doesn't, and it's not hard to be on the on the platform. And again, to, to say something nice about Pushplay, Pushplay makes it easy to to be able to receive crypto as a donation uh, as well. It'll be interesting to see what percentage of giving. But those of you know, when when they say end of year and stock giving, what what happens is in in, in America, for the, we have listeners around the world, is a lot of people give their largest donation in December. Churches really expect big December donations because people are looking at. Maybe their retirement, they made some money in the stock market, and they'll give off of that. And similarly, my assumption would be they look at their crypto, they made well, they did well in crypto, and they give some donation uh, off of that as well. But another thing that is kind of new, you know, we're talking about cutting edge, that phrase that, I don't know, been around a long time, is, is AI. So, mm -hmm. you know, for me, I, I, ironically, I am all in on using AI things. I use AI every day. I use AI to to create tweets. I use yes. AI to do research. I do not use AI to make my sermons for me. Anyway, so so we see some shift in and around AI. Talk us a little bit about that. Yeah. So it, it, it's interesting that you brought that up because I think this, this kind of points to two things. Number one is you're not alone, right? We're seeing through our research as well that people are very fascinated by, they're digging into the use of AI. They're trying to do it in a way that's, that is authentic, which is my second point to them. So we don't see people using this, our pastors using this to write sermons. We see them using this, which this should be the ultimate goal of all technology to make their life easier. Take something off my plate. How can I get the, the AI tool to help me with a social post, right? Maybe it's to kind of, you know, build out some, some content that we're going to put into a newsletter or something like that. That's what we're really seeing people use it for, not so much for sermon building. But I think it, and, and you talked about this a little bit earlier, Ed, I think that there are so many people in the church space who are fascinated by, interested in, right? Want to lean into it. But in truth, which is really the kind of second piece that came up for us in this, in this research, is that people are feeling insecure 
about making technology buying decisions, right? And we talked about this through crypto. It's like, I, I've seen this. I've seen a lot of media around it. I've seen it rise. I've seen it fall. It's like settling in now. I'm not quite sure how I feel about it. Same thing with AI. There are similar things, even with live streaming, right? So Resi Media is a, another brand underneath the PushPay umbrella who are absolute, you know, absolutely excellent in their space around live stream quality, but again, people are like, this is a big decision. I don't know much about this. And so I think one of the things that came through really loudly for me in the research was how do we help our technology buyers become more comfortable? How do we have folks like you, you know, folks like the Crossroads team who are a little bit more tech forward, really kind of share about how they're leveraging, how they're using, how they've made decisions in order to really lean into this? Because the other piece and um I always just find this fascinating. Like largest decision they need to make this year is around technology. Guess how much percentage of budget they're putting against technology on the whole? Ten. I don't know. Guess. Ten. Okay. Ten. Okay. Ten percent. Ten percent. OK, yeah. so again, you know, some things are out, out of balance a little right. bit here. And I think we're going to see that shift as well. If what we're saying is technology is one of the most important decisions to drive our church forward in the future, we also are going to have to make sure that that comes into balance and in how we're choosing to spend our resource. Interesting. Yeah. Molly, I don't want this to be an uncomfortable question for you at all, but you're you're speaking as a CEO of a tech company. Yes. And um, our I, listeners, I mean, now I'm excited about what the question is going to be. It feels like <laughs> our, our like pastors are up. our listeners are primarily uh, pastors, probably middle aged. Uh, you know, the fear of millennials was FOMO, fear of uh, missing out, and probably with some of our listeners, not all, but some of our listeners, it's more the you know FOBO, the fear of becoming obsolete. Yeah. And uh, so, of course, you're going to champion um, uh, crypto and AI. But if you were coaching a pastor uh, of a, you know, of just a normal church and they're really on the fence and uh, they need the really practical next steps, like how would you mm -hmm. do that in a way where you don't feel like you're trying to sell them something? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that the, the biggest decision that a church needs to make is do I want to grow or do I want to die? I know that sounds insanely bold, but this is what data has showed us across the years, right? And I actually was listening to, which I love this, the title, the Faithalytics. Uh, Thank you for listening talk. to Faithalytics. So we appreciate great. that. Oh my gosh, I loved it. I loved yeah, that it. Yeah, that was. We were so excited when we came up with that name. It's such a nerd name, but you it's know, it so made us great. Happy. You need to like hashtag that all over the place. Um, <laughs> and we'll, by the way, we'll put a link to that in the in the show yeah, notes if people can follow it. I think it's so relevant to the conversation that we're having. And you know, as I heard those different gentlemen kind of talk about their research and what they were essentially saying is, "Hey, you know, good news, bad news, bad news. Church specifically, Protestant church membership. You know, aligning with saying that I am a person of faith on the decline that has been happening for." for many, many years. Good news is that we are seeing some of these churches growing. And and the gentleman used the word charisma, which I think is, is a great one, right? Is these churches who have a growth mindset, same thing in business, by the way, there is no difference. If I have a growth mindset and I'm a pastor, if I have a growth mindset and I am a, a startup leader or the leader of a, a fully formed business, I have to be growing all of the time, or I am moving backwards. And so I think that's the first decision that a pastor needs to make. Do I desire to grow or am I content just being? And if my desire is to grow, Daniel, to your, your point, like what is the appropriate just one step forward? And oftentimes that is leveraging if they really don't have a presence outside of just a brick and mortar building is thinking about an application, right? How, how can I put some content in the hands of folks on a mobile device that they have with them all of the time, right? And what we try to do as a company is make that very, very easy. We have a team here at PushPay that creates that mobile device for them, puts it in their hand, and then they simply can just update content as they want to. There's also feeds that are connected to that. So I think that's a, you know, a really nice kind of like entrance in. And then I think the next piece is the the reason that people are are really leaning in to church, whether they're in person or online, so you want to take the best of both, is they desire to hear the message. They desire to hear the message. So how can you get that message 
even a shorter version of it, right? Like clip off worship, clip off, you know, all of the announcements and, and first step, just get that message into the hands of your people, run it through whatever system you possibly can. And when then you want to take it up, right? There's, there's free service offerings today to do that, right? You can do that on YouTube. You could do that on Vimeo, or if you want to like then do that and then take it up a notch, there are wonderful you know, providers, Resi Media is one of them that can help you to really kind of polish that up, make that an excellent experience. But to me, it's two things. Get content from your church into the hands of your community every single day. And number two is the reason people are really there is they want to hear that message. They want to be spiritually fed every weekend. Yeah. So how can you get that into their hands as well? I do think it's interesting too that, um, you know, with technology, comes uh, what Adam Smith would call the invisible hand of capitalism and companies mm. come along and they give you the ability to do things. I, I was, again, I mentioned the, our app and I, I kind of pulled up our app and my, my, my message is there, but what, and that's fine. So I'll scroll past my message, but the, um, but, but it is interesting. If you miss the message, it's there on the app That's right. and then it goes, but it, it's actually like an enveloping reality. So then it goes to, Hey, here's the series that Ed's going to do on Wednesday night flowing from that app. Oh, and by the way, you can fill out your connect card here. And, and from last week, we're still talking about technology leaders in technology with Eric Geiger and Bobby Gruenwald. And so, so, but maybe you need to follow the Lord in baptism. So, and this is our resources for the series. So it, it, what it does is it constantly sort of puts, and you know, constant other things, you know, there's our announcements, mental, mental health and faith all here. So, so what happens, it, it's almost like an enveloping in a positive way, because I got to tell you, you know, Facebook sending me notifications every day. I got to clean these red dots every night, yeah. you know, and so to have the church in that conversation provides more of the opportunity to engage at multiple points. So again, I'm very pro-technology, maybe a little triggered by crypto more than I need to be, but I'm very pro-technology. But I also would say too, I kind of have a, I have a chastened view of all that technology can provide. It's a tool, not the goal. Absolutely. The goal is life on life community, life change powered by the gospel, transformation, living on mission and more. And so I don't want just a bunch of bells and whistles. I want things that actually impact people who then become people who impact others. Yep. So I guess the question that I want, I want to get, and I'm going to, Daniel's going to have one more question after this, but the question that I, I want to come back to is ultimately we looked at some of the you know, key things you've talked about, man, hybrid is really, you know, some churches were pulling back after the pandemic, wonder if they did too much, but now pretty much people are all in. Uh, we're seeing things uh, with the metaverse, you know, like I said, come, come and gone. AI, we've talked about, we could unpack that some more as well. But I guess a lot of it is, and one of the key findings is decision makers experiment with cutting edge tech to engage That's right. congregants. So talk That's to right. us a little bit about what that engagement looks like. Yes, I would love to. So I think this this is like really the crux of how technology should be supporting the church, right? It should be a tool. There is not one moment in time where our technology should be taking over the role of a pastor, right? The spiritual leader of a church. Instead, it should be creating a pathway, making that the, the job of the pastor just a little bit lighter to kind of guide somebody on their engagement journey. So how we think about this is, you know, we think about first and foremost, you have to get new people who want to come into your, your church community. What is the, the most... Um, sticky way that you have a new newcomer come in. Well, that is actually through somebody who's already going there, right? At Mariners. It's people at Mariners inviting their friends, their neighbors, and others to come in. And so once they are in, then it is how do we bring them on a journey across time? We like to leverage our app for that, but that isn't the that doesn't take the place of the human connection that happens, but what it can and should and is doing for so many churches is it's also prompting a pastor like, Hey, this person has attended your church twice. They've given once. It'd be great if somebody from the pastoral team would reach out and welcome them in, invite them in. That could be a digital touch point. It could be a phone call, right? We see so many of our pastors leveraging. We have a volunteer app called the lead app that connects all of the data that's happening, you know, that we're collecting from a CHMS, that we're collecting from our custom application, from participation metrics. And so that pastor can then pull that up as they're going to visit, you know, as they're going to sit down, you know, um, at a meeting at church and, you know, kind of talk to the volunteers. And so they just have more, again, in their hand data ready to to have a really thoughtful, informed conversation. And, and you know this because, you, you know, you've been pastoring for a long time. 
is there's a lot coming at you. And so what you need are just tools to help you be the most effective, you know, pastor you can possibly be in that moment. And that's really what we're trying to do. That's great, Molly. I, uh, as we wrap up here, I, I just want to give you a little bit of a, I know you're not a prophet and uh, I know um, asking you to predict the future is probably a little bit much, but based on what you're seeing with the uh, the three years of research that you all have been doing, as we look into like, let's say the next 10 years, uh, and we're looking back, what do you think the church is getting right now? And what do you think the church is maybe having a misstep on when it comes to church and tech? Yeah, I think what they're getting right right now is they're curious. I love that. I love that what we heard is that there's a curiosity about technology and you see that in people using chatbots, you see that in people using AI, you see that in the number of decisions that are being made around technology across a given year. That was another surprising kind of fact. There's a lot of people who are changing their technology out right now. I think that is the correct thing to do. As we modernize right across the world, the church has to modernize their technology as well. So I think they're doing that correct. I think offering online giving and a way for people to be generous in their community without showing up with cash and check is is correct. That is not going away. We saw that that really kind of evolve across COVID and then stick and grow, right? Digital giving has stuck and grown. So I think they're doing that right. I think that the piece people are going to look back on later and say, man, I wish, I wish I would have, is been more thoughtful around the data story right? What information do we have about our communities and how are we leveraging that information to be more impactful, right? Sometimes when you have, and it said in, you know, our research said that the average church has seven different tools, main tools that they're using to run their community. That's, that's a lot, right? That's a lot of different data sources that you are trying to pull together to create a narrative to help you lean in and do more. So I think this is the the big the biggest opportunity for churches and businesses have fought this battle over the last five or six years as well, to be really fair. You know, how do we pull all that data together and tell a really compelling story? How do we, you know, in the church, we say, don't lose people out the back door, right? Like, Data helps us to not lose people out the back door if we're using it really well. But if we have all of these disparate kind of crummy systems that don't talk to each other, don't have API integrations, that is just going to get even worse as we move into this like hybrid is here to stay reality. We have to be thoughtful around those data points and how we use those to your point, Ed, to be impactful in a one-on-one -on -one kind of personal way. But, but people expect it, right? Like people expect it from technology today. And our churches have got to move in that direction where they are willing and open-minded to leverage the data that they've collected to, to guide somebody on the next step of their journey. We've been talking to Molly Matthews, CEO of PushPay. You can learn more about PushPay at this and this year's State of the Church Tech Report at pushpay.com. Thanks again for listening to the Sessor Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews as well as other great content from ministry leaders at churchleaders.com slash podcast. And again, if you found our conversation today helpful, we'd love for you to take a few moments to leave us a review. That'll help other ministry leaders find us and benefit from our content. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in the next episode.